When I first went to church, because um, I, I didn't grow up going to church at all, but when I first started going, I had some kind of belief in God, some kind of cosmic deity who set the world in motion maybe and kind of left us to our own devices. I even thought that Jesus sounded like a pretty all right guy, confined to the pages of history, certainly. And, but then when I started going to church, I was surrounded by people who started to talk about God as not being disinterested in us, but according to the Bible, pursuing people, talking to people, chasing after people, leading people and guiding people. And I also heard of Jesus, not just as a good guy, but claimed to be God in flesh, God's own son. Not just confined to the pages of history, but available for you and I to have a relationship with here today. But how does that work? Well, then I was introduced to the Holy Spirit, God's active agent here on earth, God's way of being with us now. And it feels like in Western culture, if you are new to church, the Holy Spirit's kind of the catch. Do you know what I mean? Like, we get people in by saying, oh, Heavenly Father, lovely, Jesus, good guy, miracle maker, all that stuff. And then the Holy Spirit's the weird stuff, right? It's like, oh, what's the big deal? What's the catch? And the thing is, is that um, it's, it, that's all got something to do with our, like, Western, modernistic, post-enlightenment brains. Because when you, flip the, uh, when you flip the script and go to the east side of the world, the challenge is reversed. Because most people with an Eastern mindset are totally fine with the spiritual realm. Totally fine with the idea of a spirit who is God. Makes total sense to an Eastern mindset. But, but God becoming human? That's another kind of question altogether. However, the Bible, right from Genesis 1, gives us this picture. In the beginning, God. This word, Hebrew word, Elohim, which is translated as Lord in capitals often if you read the Old Testament. It's this Hebrew word that lit, that's a pluralized version of the, of the form God. So he's saying that in the beginning, those who, who have the identity of God said, let there be light, and there was light. And then we're told that the Spirit was hovering above the waters. And then in Genesis 3, we're told this, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was, as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. He was walking. Sounds a bit like a man to me. Father, spirit, and God in flesh right from the very first chapters of our Bible. And so in our Bibles, we then have this narrative of God, the father of Israel, shepherding his people out of slavery into the promised land by his spirit, promising a Messiah, the son of man, and in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John map out who this Son of Man is. God's Son, the Messiah in Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Jesus dies, rises again, and before he ascends, promises that the Spirit of God will no longer just be functional for the people of Israel. But it, will just, it won't just be for huge landmark shifting moments, but Jesus has done the work so that normal people like you and like me may experience the Holy Spirit. And so we come to the book of Acts. It's called Acts because its longer name is the Acts of the Apostles, those chosen by God to do his work. It could have also been called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And I want to lay out today eight ways the Holy Spirit is shown to us in just the first two chapters of Acts. Eight ways in which we may experience the power of God by his Spirit. And then I want to finish by painting a picture of what it looked like if we met with God in that way. Does that sound all right? Wicked. The book of Acts starts with Luke, who is the writer of the book, writing out exactly what he wants to do to someone called Theophilus. Great name, isn't it, for those who are pregnant in the room? Theophilus. Theo for sure, or Philly. Means lover of God. And it says this, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. Giving instructions through the Holy Spirit. So number one, the Spirit teaches. John 14, 26 says this, it's Jesus speaking. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. Have you ever had that moment where you're out partying with some friends or you're on your way to work or you're on your way to a lecture and suddenly a Bible verse just drops in and you remember something? That's the Holy Spirit doing that. The Holy Spirit is reminding you of all the things that he has told you. John 16, 13 says this, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. 
He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you the things to come. The Holy Spirit's role is to teach us. And Isaiah, the prophet, right many, many hundred years before Jesus, says this, The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. The Spirit teaches us. Well, how? Supernatural wisdom through insight, through that nagging feeling in your stomach. And I feel sometimes when it comes to supernatural wisdom, on occasion, the Holy Spirit gives me wisdom that is not of my own doing. Because to be honest, I'm a very simple guy who messed up his GCSEs because I was too busy trying to get a girlfriend. I then messed up my A-levels because I got a girlfriend. I then, the only reason I got onto doing a uni degree, I mean, I got onto a uni degree with only having a C and a D and A-level, right? I had a D in uh, drama and I had a C in music tech. That was it. And I managed to get onto a degree because I blagged my way on, um, because I read a lot and I, I'd read a few books, and so I blagged my way onto it. And, and then in my first essay, in the first term, I got the highest grade given to a first-year student in the 10-year history of the college that I went to. And that wasn't because I was the smartest in the room. I definitely was not. Even now, this week, my wife, Laura, she was in Barcelona for the week with her mum, having a lovely time. And I was doing, uh, we got three girls, and I was doing all the school runs and all the post-school activities and trying to lead church well and work full-time. And, and I know loads of people do this, like on the regs, but I do not. But could I remember what time our kids start and finish school every day? No. Had to text Laura literally every day. Couldn't remember what, which shoes belong to which girl. We've got three girls and all their school uniforms look exactly the same. So I'm like, whose belongs to what? Could I do all of that? No. But give me a moment in the, in the midst of that to talk about church strategy or how we can create systems for growth. And I'm like, yeah, now I'm cooking with gas. I need supernatural wisdom, right? But insight. Have you ever looked at someone And a thought has jumped into your head, an emotion that you just can't shake off. It might be you walk past someone and you you feel like you know something deep about them. Or it might be that you're chatting to a friend over a pint and they're telling you something about their day. But you know you can almost feel the deeper truth that's going on there. One time I was on the tube on the way home from work in London. And there was this guy who sat opposite me. And and I just got this feeling real quick in the pit of my stomach that this guy was really sad. I don't mean sad because he liked Coldplay. I meant like, like he's got a deep sadness within himself. And I said to the Lord, because I'm obedient, I said, well, I'll say something if he doesn't get off at the next stop. And he didn't get off the next stop. And I was like, I don't mean that stop, God. I mean like the next stop. If he doesn't get off, then I'll say something. He didn't get off the next stop. I was like, okay, God, I'm the God of threes. You like to, okay, the next stop, if he doesn't get off. And he didn't get off the third stop. And I was like, all right, God, I'll say something. And all I said to him is, are you all right, mate? And, and I mean, Londoners don't talk to each other on the tube. It doesn't happen. Um, and this guy just burst into tears. And basically, he had just been fired from his job, and he was working out what to say to his wife and children on his way home. And he got off on my stop, and so it meant that we walked down the road a bit together. And I said, this might sound weird, but can I pray for you? Because I, I, I don't really have much advice for you. And he's like, yeah, please do. And I didn't see the guy again. But there's something about the Spirit of the Lord resting upon us and giving us wisdom and understanding, counsel and might. The Holy Spirit teaches us. What else does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit baptizes. Acts 1 verse 4 says this. On one occasion, while he, this is Jesus, was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days he'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. We take baptism seriously here at Penny Lane. If ever you want to like, walk up this little pathway and um, on the wall, we got a load of photos of people being baptized. We love a good baptism. Last week, we baptized a few people. And what does baptism do? Well, it cleanses. There's a spiritual cleansing that happens. That's why we use water. But it also sets apart. It says publicly, I'm going to now live differently to how I might have lived before. But thirdly, it unites you into a wider family of those who have been baptized. So the Holy Spirit baptizes. What does that mean? Well, the Holy Spirit is God's helper first to help you kick that habit and break that chain or stop that pattern or reverse that cycle. It's the Holy Spirit. The good news is you do not have to muster up your sheer goodwill to kick that addiction that you're struggling with right now. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that makes us holy. You don't have to behave yourself into God's good books. It's the Holy Spirit that makes you holy. It's the Holy Spirit that does that stuff. It's the Holy Spirit that helps us to resist temptation. It's why when the disciples asked Jesus, teach us how to pray. 
And he teaches them that prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer. Part of that is we need to continue to pray that we would resist temptation. Because it's not about us mustering up sheer goodwill. It's not about us creating a great habit to overcome that habit. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. But it's also the Holy Spirit that helps us see the world through a spiritual lens and sets us apart and ultimately connects us to one another. It's the Holy Spirit that unites us. Not a denomination or church branding, but the Holy Spirit. Who in this room grew up going to a Pentecostal church? A few. Who grew up going to a Baptist church? Catholic? Non-denominational? House church? No church? Fair few. Any other? Would you put other in the box? Anyone? You're wicked. The thing is, yet we all find unity in this room today because of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that unites us. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit empowers. Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. What do witnesses do? Witnesses just say what they've seen. And so what the Holy Spirit does, gives us power to be able to say what we have seen. The thing is, if you've become a Christian, if you started following Jesus, it can be a scary idea that now you have a purpose, which is to go and communicate to others what you have seen, right? Is that not a scary thing? Who loves the idea of telling all their mates about Jesus every day? Like a few of you evangelists, that's because you have a spiritual gift. Who doesn't? Who's terrified by that prospect? A few more in the room. What if you're terrified of people? What if you're unsure or you're doubting? How do we do it then? Well, God sends his spirit to give us power. It's not about you learning techniques. It's not about you learning some crafty ways of sharing the gospel. It's about the Holy Spirit giving us power to be his witnesses, to just say what we see. When I was, uh, I've been a Christian just two years, and so I was still messing up quite a lot. Um, but my uh, pastor at the time said, uh, do you want to come to Sweden with me? Not, that's not what pastors normally do uh, if you're new to church. and We don't have loads of tickets to Sweden. But um, he was a speaker, would speak all over the place. And he was invited to go to this church in Sweden. And he asked me if I'd just go and assist him. I was like, for sure, because only, I've only flown once before to Tenerife with my mother. And this seems a bit more interesting than that. So we went to Sweden. And... Um, and he spoke the first night, and everyone loved it, and it was brilliant. And we went, we went over for Swedish meatballs to a restaurant across the road. The next day, uh, spoke the, in the morning. I was, like, clapping along, like, writing my notes, like, nodding like a good little boy in the front row. And then the, the evening session of the second day, he said, I've brought a friend with me. I was like, it's me. I'm his mate. Um, and he said, and he's um, pretty experienced and pretty gifted in the area of healing. And I was looking behind my shoulder. I was like, I was the only person who came with him, and that's not me. And then he said, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to invite my friend up to the stage and anyone who has uh, anything they want healing for, um, he's going to pray for them and uh, we're going to see what God's going to do. I mean, how scary is that? And so I came up, I came up on the stage because I'm obedient and, um, and he said, so uh, does anyone have anything they want healing for? And Swedes are a bit like British people, like no one went forward. <laughs> no, everyone was like, nope. Apart from a little old lady who started to get a bit like, a bit of sympathy for me. She kind of waddled up the front, and she, was, she had help getting up on the stage, and her name was Hild. And, um, and through a translator, we found out that Hild's problem was her back. She had a really bad back. And so he said, cool, Alex, he loves, loves praying for healing. He does, loves it. I think I prayed for one migraine once before, maybe. Um, and he said, loves praying for it. Really experienced, brilliant, brilliant. He's going to pray for you now. Said, Don't worry about it, Hild. He's got your back, literally. And so, um, <laughs> and so um, I laid a hand on an appropriate place, her shoulder, and I prayed the, like the worst prayer in all of healing history. And as I was praying for Hild, her face started to screw up. And I was like turning to translator, thinking, is this a Swedish culture thing? That I've, and no, no, she looks like she's in pain. And she was like wincing. And then she started going, ow, ow, and like rubbing her back. And I was like, I'm making it worse. Like I'm so bad at this praying malarkey that this woman's back is now worse than it was when she came in. And so then what happened was the pastor said, um, after he prayed for her for a little while, it was like, this clearly isn't getting better and she's clearly in a bit of pain. Um, she might need to find a seat. He did all that thing that some pastors do where they like glaze over it a bit with some biblical waftiness. And she went and sat down. And I spent all night thinking I've broken an old Swedish lady. And then um, all night I found it hard to sleep, came up on the Sunday morning and, and the next morning and I sat on the front row thinking I'm awful, I'm a terrible person. And no Swede wanted to chat to me. They didn't want me to touch them. They didn't want to shake my hand in case I had this curse upon me that was going to make their ailments worse. Just as they're about to start, this little old lady started skipping down the middle aisle. They had an aisle. 
started skipping, jumping, dancing. She could touch her toes. I can't even touch my toes. Do you know what I mean? She could touch her toes. She was like, he's healed me. He's healed me. And do you know what I love about that story is I was not the hero in that story whatsoever. I had no experience. I had no knowledge. I had nothing to give at that moment. I was just obedient to the guy who said he's going to pray. And the thing is, our prayer team that come down here on the left, sometimes to pray for people at the end of the service, they're not the heroes. They're just simply wanting to be used by God to be a vessel in those moments. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us power. Fourthly, the Holy Spirit speaks. It says this, in those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said this, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. The Holy Spirit spoke. The Holy Spirit speaks to us. It was the Holy Spirit who spoke to the writers of the Bible, which means that when you read this book, made up of 66 different books, over 40 different authors, describing about 4,000 years of history, written in a 1,600-year period, It has a unity that is unparalleled amongst any other literature. It's the Holy Spirit that speaks to you when you pick up the Bible randomly and flip it open and suddenly that verse hits you like something new and something fresh. It's the Holy Spirit that sometimes speaks to you when we're singing a song of worship and a a lyric hits home in a new way. It's sometimes the Holy Spirit that gives us words or pictures in our imagination that speak to a deeper truth. The Holy Spirit speaks to us. But fifthly, the Holy Spirit fills. Acts 2 starts like this. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house while they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. All of them were filled. Not just the in crowd, not just the ones who had degrees, not just Jesus' special crew, all of them were filled. What does that mean? Well, this is where it gets a bit personal. The thing is, throughout the entirety of the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would rest on particular individuals for a particular purpose. On Joseph to interpret dreams, on Bezalel to create the Ark of the Covenant, on Joshua for his leadership, on Othniel and Gideon and Jephthah and Samson for their military might to give their military advantage against the odds, for Saul for the gift of prophecy, for David to rule the people of God. However, what happens at that first Pentecost is all people were filled with the Holy Spirit. And the first gift was speaking in tongues so that others would hear the good news of Jesus Christ in their own language because the Holy Spirit always unites. So all people are now able to experience the Holy Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit of God. And when you're filled with the Spirit of God, you may feel and experience a multitude of things. You may experience a peace that makes no sense. You may experience a joy that is beyond circumstance, a love that is without bounds, a kindness that feels radical. Who needs a bit more peace, joy, love, and kindness? Anyone in the room? A few of us. This is the f- called the f- fruit of the Spirit. Sometimes when I'm prayed for and I adopt the holy position, close my eyes and have my hands out, someone prays for me, I feel absolutely nothing. And that's all right too. But sometimes I feel a calm that is bizarre. Because my mind, to be honest with you, runs at like 100 miles an hour I find it difficult to sit still and relax. I really enjoy thinking and I really enjoy doing things. And so when sometimes I'm prayed to be filled with the Holy Spirit, I know it is God because I don't have those other things running through my mind. I just get to focus on Jesus. I just get to see his beauty for a moment. I just get to know my worth is not in my doing or my knowing, but to be found as a child of God in his hands, to, be, to hear a glimmer of the song of heaven that is sung over us. We might feel that kind of stuff. But we don't simply feel things. The Holy Spirit also equips. Acts 2, 17 to 18 says this, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit 
in those days, and they will prophesy. Even on my servants, both men and women. If you're a man or a woman, put your hand up. Wicked. The Holy Spirit wants to equip you for the works of service. Not just people who hold microphones. Not just people with degrees. Not just people who even love scripture. The Holy Spirit wants to empower all people, both men and women, all servants of God. He wants to pour out his spirit in those days. The Holy Spirit gives us gifts to tackle this thing called life. And in a dark world, bring the light and life of Jesus wherever we go. Not in our own strength. We aren't just a nice charity hoping that someone will stop as we chug them on the street. That's not the way of the kingdom. But we're given, we're an army and we're given weapons for the kingdom of God. And the weapons look like this, 1 Corinthians 12. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. Do you notice that it's not about like to make the church grow? Do you get that? It's not just to make the brand of whatever version of Christianity you follow more popular. It's for the common good, which means those outside the church should be blessed by the Holy Spirit empowering us. Our best mates don't know Jesus should be impacted by the Holy Spirit giving us gifts for the common good. And what does that look like? To one there is given the spirit of message, the spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are work of one and the same spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miraculous powers, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits. Speaking different kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues. Why? Well, it's so we may taste heaven on earth. So we may taste heaven on earth. Because one day, the picture that the Bible paints of heaven, we will be able to seek Jesus face to face for his wisdom and his knowledge. But for now, while on earth, his spirit will give us droplets of heavenly wisdom and knowledge when we need it. One day in heaven, we won't need faith or healing because we'll be able to see Jesus face to face. And the Bible says there is healing in God's presence. But for now, the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to have faith and sometimes even experience healing. One day we won't need miracles or the necessity to know what God may be saying to individuals because in his presence, he, we will have all we need. But for now, the miraculous powers and the gifts to speak into people's lives gives us heavenly wisdom and encouragement and guidance for the moment. One day we won't need to distinguish between spirits or speak and interpret different kinds of tongues because in his presence, Jesus will take care of all of that. But for now, he sends his spirit to protect us from evil and to speak the gospel in earthly and heavenly languages and have those interpret them. When I was about 19 years of age, I was training to be a youth worker. Um, I didn't do any more healing trips after that. Um, but I was training to be a youth worker, and I took a group of young people to Chile in South America. And we were with an evangelistic organization that was Chilean. And uh, so we were the only uh, um, English-speaking people with, the, with this big group. And part of the, uh, part of the week, we, they're putting on a huge evangelistic concert in the middle of Santiago, which is the capital of Chile. And what we had to do is at rush hour in the middle of Santiago was we had to take out flyers in Santiago and give them to busy commuters on their way to invite them to this free concert. And I, um, because I'm this kind of guy, I love a language. I love speaking a language. And my youth group was very nervous about this, doing this in another language. So I was like, I will go first. And so I took a flyer and uh, bumped into this uh, very busy looking um, uh, Chilean lady. And she was on her way to work, clearly. And I, gave, I had a flyer in my hands, and I said, Soy un cristiano anglicano, ilia un concerto evangelistico, con musica, eh, balero, uh, mañana, mañana, at the end of the week. And I gave, it, I gave it to this lady, and she burst into tears. And I was like, what have I said? What, what Spanish swear word have I come up with that suddenly I've offended this lady so much? And we were luckily, there was a Chilean in our group, and she saw this interaction from afar, ran across the road, came up to us, 
And she started having this hurried conversation with this lady. So I'm so sorry. He's from England. He has no idea what he's actually saying. He's just picked up a phrase book and thought, I'll have a go at this. And, and they were chatting and chatting and chatting. And then at the end of it, I was just kind of stood back. And I was like, what's going on here? I'm really sorry if I've offended you. And our Chilean friend who was with us, she said, what did you say to her? And I was like, well, I can demonstrate again. Soy un anglicano, Cristiano. I went through it all. And she was like, that's not what she heard. She said, what, what you said to her was the story of the prodigal son that's found in the Bible. About a story of a son who um, gives away his inheritance and lives a life that's radically away from the father and then goes back to meet his father and thinks his father's going to be angry with him and instead uh, throws his arms around him and, and gives him a, a hug and a kiss and reinstates him to a place of, of, of being a part of the family. I was like, I did not say that. I didn't, but what she heard was something completely different. And what I love about that story, again, is I'm not the hero there at all. My broken Spanish, God used to communicate his gospel truth there. You see how sometimes the gift of tongues is, is like the stuff that's now like resigned to Netflix documentaries about the church, right? It's like the weird stuff, like please don't. What's amazing is God uses our earthly languages in ways that communicate his gospel. He also uses our made up prayer languages in ways that will communicate the gospel. God will use anything that he can get his hands on to communicate his overwhelming love for his children. The Holy Spirit does it. Number seven, the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus. It says this in Acts 2, 32, 33. God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Do you see that chain? Exalted to the right hand of God. He's received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and he's now pouring it out, what you now see and hear. The Holy Spirit will never ever do something unJesus like Do you get me? The, the Holy Spirit will never do something that is not like Jesus. If you're ever worried about the Holy Spirit, maybe you're new to church, like why are we talking about this on the day that I brought my best mate who doesn't know Jesus? I'm like, don't worry. Because if you ever get freaked out, pick up your Bibles, read the Gospels. That's how the Holy Spirit acts. The Holy Spirit acts like Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of the Father and the Son. One theologian puts it like this. The Holy Spirit is the love between the Father and the Son that creates space so me and you can enter into that relationship too. But know that if you want to find out the character of the Holy Spirit, we look at Jesus. If you want to look at how the Holy Spirit moves, we look at Jesus. If you want to know the kind of things the Holy Spirit might say to you, we look at Jesus. There's a famous painting called Rublev's Icon. There's a uh, version of it in uh, Liverpool Cathedral. But here's a, um, a version done by a Ukrainian artist. Um, but if you notice, so in the middle we have the Father. On the right-hand side we have the Spirit in pictorial form. And on the left, Jesus. Where's the attention? They're both looking at Jesus. It's like the Old Testament is, say, is, is, is the Father constantly saying, you wait, it's going to get so good because in a few hundred years, I'm going to send my son. And then there'll be no more questions that need answering about who I am or what kind of character I am, what kind of things I'm going to say, the kind of love I give. In a moment, you're going to see Jesus and it's going to be amazing. And then we get to the Acts of the Apostles and we've just constantly got the Holy Spirit going, this is really cool, but it's only cool because it's pointing you towards Jesus. These healings are cool because they show you the power of God's love. They show you the love of Jesus. All these things. Things that are happening, it's all about Jesus. The Holy Spirit's main goal is to reveal Jesus. He gives us wisdom so we may know what Jesus wants us to do. He gives us knowledge so we may know what Jesus wants us to know. He gives us faith so we may believe in Jesus. He gives us healing so we may know the love of Jesus. He gives us miraculous powers so we may do the things that Jesus did. He gives us the gift of prophecy so we may be able to speak like Jesus. He gives us the gift of discerning between spirits who may be able to fill the room like Jesus. He gives us the gift of speaking in different kinds of tongues so you may sound like Jesus. And he gives us the interpretation of tongues so you may hear like Jesus. The Holy Spirit reveals Jesus. And finally, the Holy Spirit gives. Acts 2, 38 to 39. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Here is the kicker. Christians in the room, the Holy Spirit isn't just for us. The Holy Spirit was never meant for just the in crowd. 
The Holy Spirit isn't like the VIP package for the Christian crew. It's for us, it's for our children, and for all who are far off. If you are exhausted tonight, the Holy Spirit is for you. If you're in doubt, the Holy Spirit is for you. If you're at the end of your rope, the Holy Spirit is for you. If you're addicted, the Holy Spirit is for you. If you're depressed, the Holy Spirit is for you. If you're lonely, hurt, confused, abused, and desperate, the Holy Spirit is for you. Because if you are strong, you don't need the Holy Spirit. It's only when you're lacking and in need that you dare cry, come Holy Spirit. So why? Why do we do it? Why does the Holy Spirit come and do these things? What difference does it really make? Acts 2.41 says this, those who accepted this message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Churches don't just grow like that because the worship is good, the coffee's hot and the cookies are warm. Church like that grow because the Holy Spirit thinks it's a good idea. The Holy Spirit says, you know what? These guys know what it looks like to share my love and then I can give them a bit more. It goes on, Acts 2, 42, 44. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. What would our city be like if we truly devoted ourselves to each other, ate together and prayed together? That's basically what we're meant to be doing. Church can get very complex very quickly, can't it? We can start thinking, well, I, oh, I need my course for whatever or I need my thing. And All we're asked to do is devote ourselves to each other. What does that mean? It means love each other radically in a way as if we are actually brothers and sisters. That get on. It's not like my brothers and sisters. That's not a good model at all. But devote ourselves to each other, to eat together, and to pray for one another. And then, if we get that right, then we're told everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the, by the apostles. Do you know why I think that is? I think that we're told that we can't possibly be trusted with the miraculous if we aren't loving right first. That the Holy Spirit will entrust the miraculous if we get the love right first, we need to pray that we'll be filled with Holy Spirit, God's love made manifest in our hearts so that one day we will be used for miraculous wonders and deeds. So in our time, our city will come to know the love, power, and freedom of Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's stand. We're going to pray.